Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with Councillor for the City of Kingston, Ontario, Brandon Tozo. But before we get into today's interview, we would like to remind you to hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of our latest episodes and interviews. Now, on to the show. Councillor Tozo, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with my very first question that I've asked every single person who's ever come on my show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Uh, first, thank you for having me. I'm really, I always love talking uh, politics and talking shop and local politics, especially. Uh, really excellent question. Uh, I think there were two factors that really got me into wanting to get into government and wanting to get into local government, especially. Um, the first was I have a job and I'm a union local president. I've been involved in labor movement for oh about 20 years. Um, and I spent the pandemic uh, fighting for frontline workers and fighting for people who really kind of kept uh, the, this province going. Uh, um, I defended a bunch of nurses and a few others in, in, in my local as well. Um, and I think that the real reason I decided to jump in at this point, um, sort of, I, I don't know if we're at post pandemic or towards the several years into this, uh, I don't want to get into controversy about that, um, was I saw that these people who had sacrificed so much get completely left behind. Uh, we called them heroes. And then when the crisis was over, uh, they had to go away. And as somebody who spent the past three years just fighting for them, uh, crying with them, working with them, and then being told they had to go away, um, that was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, and I looked at... Um, yahoos in ottawa and yahoos in queen's park and i thought maybe this yahoo could be there too uh trying to advocate uh so uh i remember i came from a, a grievance i don't want to get into too much details um where i was defending nurses and it went very poorly uh and i walked away and three days later i said i'm putting my name on the ballot and that was my real uh real reason that i decided to get involved in politics uh i just I, I saw the way that the wind was blowing and there has to be somebody better. Um, I never thought I'd get involved in politics. I, I do have a doctoral degree in political science and government. But there's one thing to study and another thing to get involved in it. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful that I got elected. Uh, I didn't realize so many people felt the same way I did. And when I took my story to the doors of my neighbors, uh, I think it just really resonated. Um, the second reason why I got involved uh, is I'm a parent of, uh, of two wonderful children, a five-year-old and a uh, one-year-old, um, and my my five-year-old has special needs. And I think as a parent, um, and this is my general governing philosophy, we always have to govern, I think, based on the idea of what we leave behind. And are we making the world a better place, or are we just meeting what people want today? Uh, and... I, I, I think being a parent has really given me a real sense of a broader idea of community, a broader idea of our, of our city, a broader idea of our country, and a broader idea of where the world is and where I think the world needs to be. Because um, one day I'm going to be gone, and what's left behind are my kids, and they have to live in a world that's better. And I think we have a real opportunity to make the world better and deal with you know a housing crisis, a climate crisis. There's crisis everywhere. Um, but I think leadership at this point really matters. And I think having people who really care matters. Um, and those are really the two reasons that I got involved. So there's a lot to digest in that statement that you just made there. But I want to learn a little bit more about who Brandon is and sort of his journey. Um, I, I, I'm one of those families that politics was discussed at the dinner table because my family was politically active. We had family members run in the 1990 Ontario election. We had back mayors and councillors on our, in our family. So we were very politically active for you. Uh, it seems like your family would be politically active with a PhD in political science, 
but at the dinner table growing up, was politics discussed? And if so, was it municipal politics, which you're entered into now, or was it more federal and provincial politics? Uh Oddly enough, my family was not super political. Uh, my dad and my mom, I don't think they voted until I got to adulthood. Uh, we Politics was not, uh, I come from a very working working class family, and, and I think that they were both just dealing with the struggles of the day and kind of uh, putting, putting food on the table to care really much about politics. Um, my political awakening really happened in my... Uh, in my early uh, adulthood, um, in the late 1990s, uh, when I was a young man, and my knees can attest to the fact that I'm no longer a young man, um, when Mike Harris got into office and started making all of his cuts, I organized my first protest against Mike Harris, you know, at the age of 17. Um, and, and, you know, it was that that kind of got me more engaged and I started to get really, really interested in politics and government, especially uh, local, municipal and federal politics. Um, and then uh, when I started university, uh, I, I decided to attend. Uh, this was around 2003, 2004, and all the sort of prime ministers uh, and leaders of political parties came to Western University. Uh, so I got to meet Stephen Harper and Jack Layton and uh, Paul Martin. And something about just the, their leadership and that whole engagement just really got me hooked. And I think I've been hooked ever since. So in 2022, you decide that after being having a career in academia, having a career uh, as a union representative, to put your name forward municipally. Um, why then? And I know you talk about the grievance and you talk about what was going on personally for you, but you talked and you said it in your opening statement, I'm quoting you, there was yahoos in Queen's Park, there were yahoos in uh, the House of Commons, but you didn't say, and I, I took this as, as a note, there's no yahoos at Kingston City Hall. So you decide <laughs> that you're going to get involved municipally. So what was the yeah. ultimate decision that you said even with my background, with my union representative, with what's going on with the nurses during COVID, I believe my first step needs to be City Hall, particularly right here, right now. Yeah, very good question. Um, I think one one area where I'm, I'm really quite aware um, is I've gotten to know people who are MPs and MPPs. Uh, and I have a young family and I've seen the toll that that takes on their personal lives. Um, it is very hard to be away five days a week in Ottawa and five days a week in, in Toronto and not have those moments with your kids. Uh, first and foremost, I try to put my family above everything else. Um, and I felt at that time, um, because that election was sort of coming up, uh, this was an area where I could affect the most change uh, close to home. And that was very important to me. Um, I, I I think there is great work that can be done provincially and federally. Um, and there are great people working there. And maybe down the road when my kids are a bit older, um, I, I might venture into different levels of government uh, because they have more money and more resources and can better affect that. Uh, I think with a young family, this was just a really great opportunity to get involved uh, and make that change that I really want to see at a local level. I I was, I was, didn't have an axe to grind locally. Um, it was just, what's the most, where can I pour the most energy and get the best outcome? Uh, and I've also found that party politics are very frustrating. Um, so I, I really witnessed, I think, as politics has gotten more polarized, there's less voice for individuals who kind of want to think through and problem solve. Um, one thing I really like about municipal politics is there isn't a party banner attached to you. You uh, govern based on your evidence, your philosophy, and your constituents. Uh, and that's something I really like. Um, I, I don't think I would fit well in any political party because just I'm not a yes man. And that ability to just do what the leader says, it isn't me. So the the war the district sorry in in, in Kingston it's called, they're called districts in, in the district of Kings Court Rito there's no incumbent running in the 2022 municipal election the account the incumbent councillor if I'm not mistaken decides to run provincially for the NDP so it's an open yeah. field 
Um, you go out, start door knocking. I'm assuming during your time in university, during your time uh, 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 being an uh, organizer, you had been out on the doorstep. You had to door knock before, so it is not something new to you. But there's always a different perspective when your name's on the ballot, when your name's on the sign, when your name's on the brochure. For you, what did you learn about yourself during that experience of going out and sort of trying to pitch yourself to the general public about why you believe your voice should be on Kingston City Council? Um, I sort of two things. Uh, I found it very hard to see my name and 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 face on signs. I I I just there's something really weird about that. <laughs> where I found it really odd. I I I try to be a humble person, and it's just I was raised in a very kind of humble background with a lot of um. I, I have three, uh, two other siblings, and. I was a middle child and I just didn't, that's not my, my kind of personality is I want to put my name on, on, on a sign. So my campaign team was like, no, you gotta do the sign stuff and put your face on signs. That was, that was weird. Um, that's something I really found out. Um, the other thing is I think conceptually, I, I just viewed it as talking to neighbors. So when I knock on a door, I was, I didn't think of like, oh, I'm going to sell myself as being the greatest. I'm like, Hey, I'm your neighbor from down the street. This is, this is my story. This is the problems we seem to have. Let's talk. And that worked. In, you know, when people don't think of you as a politician, but just a guy, uh, you know, one guy said, you know, you're just like the dad down the street who just wants to make the park better. And I'm like, yeah, like there, there there's just there's no like ulterior motives. I just, just I, 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 I'm running and I was I think just authentic on who I am. Um and I think when you you don't view yourself as a politician, but you just view yourself as someone who cares, um, and the guy down the street who just wants to make the world better for people and his kids and the community better, uh, I found that really resonated. Um, but yeah, it is it is very different putting your name on the ballot, and putting your name out there, um, because ultimately at the end of the day, it is it's a it's 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 a test if people trust you. And I, I'm uh, this is the first time I've ever run a campaign. Uh, I I'm incredibly honored that the citizens of my district decide to vote um uh, talking about the humble part about seeing your name on the sign seeing your photo on the sign in 2010 i ran my first campaign and my but the humble part for that was seeing my name on the ballot because after all the work after all the doors you've knocked you go in and you you at least you know you get one vote right you get one vote because you're voting for yourself everyone else could not so that for me was the humble part to say I I I could only do as much as I did, and it's in the people's hands now. So that's where I was humbled. It is a very humbling experience if you're you're not uh, if if you're if you're new to it. So um, yeah, and uh, you know uh, I have a belief in democracy, and I I remember saying to my campaign team, you know, at the end of the day, we've had a good campaign, we've got ourselves out there. Uh, it's really up to the people, and. If the people want me, great. And if not, this was, I turned 40 last year. Uh, it's cheaper than buying a new car. Uh, and uh, a little hard on a few pairs of shoes, but it was just a, it was a, just a wild adventure. Even if it went poorly, like I met so many phenomenal people um, just knocking on doors. It was just such a great experience. So um, this show has come out of the idea that municipal government isn't, the sexy government. It's not the one that is talked about a lot. And when I talk to people from across Canada who are not municipal councillors, and I ask them what the municipal issues are, it's usually provincial or federal issues. There's very there's a big misunderstanding of the levels of jurisdictions and what their roles and responsibilities are. For you during, the, and I'm assuming since you have a PhD in political science, you know them, during that election, though, in your first election in 2022, when you were door knocking, did you hear actual municipal issues or were they a range of issues, whether it be school board, federal, provincial? And how do you see your role as counselor now that you've been elected in addressing the issues that aren't in your jurisdiction, but people want you to address? Yeah, very good question. Um, so, I mean, I, I think voters don't really have a differentiation of different levels of government. Um, but I, I think what I've really learned is being a counselor is advocacy is large is part of the job. Um, I've, I've spent a great deal of time 
uh, not just working on municipal issues and issues related directly to my district. So like, you know, potholes, traffic, parks, garbage. Um, but I also spent a lot of time talking to other levels of government, talking to MPPs and MPs, uh, emailing them. Uh, we just came from the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, where I talked to pretty much most of the cabinet about issues affecting my district. Um, that was really a, a real eye opener, um, being able to just, you know, advocate and lobby other levels of government. Uh, and we can use council to pass motions to raise the issues and awareness to other levels of government. Um, one thing I've been really working on is the National School Nutrition Program. Uh, it's in the Liberal platform. Uh, they've put it, it's not yet in the budget, but I'm try I passed a motion. I've been working with uh, I worked with the opposition in uh, in Queens Park, and I'm going to meet with uh, the MP locally to try to just get this on the radar and get it done in the next budget. So. Uh, what I often say to constituents is that's not municipal, but I'm going to advocate for it. And that is, I think that's half the job. Um, you, you talk about how you were at the recent AMO conference and you were discussing local district issues. Um, but yeah. when you're elected, especially in a city that has districts or a ward, you're not, you're, you're elected at that ward or district level, but you're there to represent the entire city. Have you found that balance of balancing the needs of what your residents want in the ward and the district that you represent with the city? Because when budgets come forward, it's not just the Kings Court Rito budget, it's the Kingston budget. And you have to try to figure out how you're going to balance uh, your residents not getting everything that they want, because I can imagine... Uh, because I lived in uh, on Wilson Street in Rideau, that there is <laughs> there is many different issues that are going on in your community, particularly potholes. So how do you balance what your residents want with the entire city as a whole? Because you're there to represent the city and not just your communities. That's a very good question. And Wilson Street is a terrific street and a terrific part <laughs> of the district. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, are you... Were you on North Wilson or South Wilson? Because that's a, it's a very different street, north to south. <laughs> north, north. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I know the I know the area quite well. Yeah. Uh, so right now there's a beautiful community center right by where right by where you used to live, which is just a phenomenal part of that community. And Shannon Park is amazing. I I love it. I love it. And uh, I spent a lot of time at that community center with my family. When I originally um, so reached out to interview you, I did not know you represented this area. So when I when I did research, I was like, oh, wow, I am shocked that I'm talking to my, if he was there 10, 15 years ago, he would have been my counselor. Yeah, I, I love Rito Heights. It is such a great community. Like what a great part of the city. Um, I, I think... I think this council is quite unique um, to previous councillors is it doesn't feel like we're in our, um, we're in just our districts. Like I, I really do get a sense we recognize we're part of a whole, we're part of a larger city. Um, and those, there's a large assumption and understanding with other West End councillors and East End councillors that the issues that are affecting this area of town will are spreading throughout the city and the issues affecting the West End are spreading throughout the city. Um, there's a real sense that we are one big, big city, that we're, we're, we're team Kingston. Um, and I know previous councils have been very divided along geographic lines and along downtown versus West End. Uh, I don't get the sense in that, this council, this council, there's, a, we've, I think it's part of the after effects of the pandemic. There's kind of this real sense that we're all in this together. Um, and at certain districts just need different things. And there's a lot of, I think, general understanding that Kings Court Rito and Kingstown have very different political and social issues uh, than the West End. And there needs to be just different resources related to that. Um, so one thing I'm really proud of is our new strategic uh, plan. There was a general understanding of that we cannot concentrate shelters and affordable housing in Williamsville Kings Court Rito and Kingstown, where traditionally it has always been. And even West End councillors looking at the data were like, you're right, there's way too much concentrated in one area. Um, that was a win, but that is rare councils would do that and other councillors would say that. So I think that there is just a lot more affability on council. And I think that's a byproduct of the type of people who this pandemic have produced. Um, for some people, I think this pandemic left people more angry and more frustrated. I think that the other story of this pandemic is left 
more people recognizing that we have a lot more in common than we don't, than we have a lot of differences. Um, and I'm really, I think, quite honored to serve with a council that really wants to tackle citywide problems. We're going to talk about some of the issues that Kingston's going through in a few seconds here, but I want to uh, end end this segment with this question because you are a dad. You are a relatively new dad compared to uh, some who might have served or are serving with you. How do you balance the personal and private life of a counselor, particularly in one that you don't go off to Ottawa to do your job? You don't go off to Toronto to do your job. You make a decision at city council. You're at the grocery store that night or that next morning. So how do you balance the life of being Councillor Tozo with just being Brandon? Good, great question. I'll let you know when I figure it out. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, it's very real. Uh, and walking down the street with your kids, you, you, you there's really, you're never off. Um, I, I, I think, uh, one of the old time school politicians uh, who was an MP and a mayor and a counselor, uh, John Gerritsen, gave me the best advice uh, I've ever gotten in politics is you'll spend more time listening than talking. Um, as an extrovert, that's hard, but it is such a valuable piece of advice is people really do want to be heard. And even if they don't agree with you, they I think most people just do appreciate that you're listening. Uh and that is how I balance it all. Because uh, oh. suddenly I'll be like, the weird thing about being a counselor is most people don't know who you are, but the people who do really care. Uh, and you have to sort of turn on that your the listening mode. Uh, and I, I think I think most people appreciate that. Okay, um, I, I want to. I, I was going to change to the next subject, but you just brought up something I need to ask. There's an apathy when it comes to municipal politics particularly not knowing who their councillors are, who their mayors are. Now, I just did a recent tour from Calgary to Quebec, driving the entire way, visiting communities like Kingston, like Belleville, like uh, Brockville. And every time I go into communities, I always ask the same question to people at Tim Hortons. Who's your local mayor? Who's your local councillor? The majority of people don't know. Why do you think that is? Why do you think there is an apathy when it comes to municipal politics and knowing who their councillors are? Because we saw in the last municipal election, voter turnout was down. Yeah, that that's a very good question. Uh, I'm reminded of an anecdote where I was having a, a coffee with our MPP, and I asked the table next to us who the MPP is, and they said uh, they named the person from ten years ago, uh, and the MPP was rather humiliated by that. Uh, he, he's no longer the MVP. This was a few years ago before the pandemic. Uh, I think I think a problem I'm going to relate to is due to, the, due to media and due to the attention span that we spend so much time on leaders, we don't spend much time on local politicians. Um, yeah. I think most people know who the mayor is. Most people know who the prime minister is. Uh, most people know who the premier is. But when you get down to like even who uh, the cabinet the cabinet leader of health who affects most of our lives um, or, you know, the, the minister of health or the minister of finance, I think most people tend to turn off. Uh, I don't think it's apathy. I think it's just, we are such a leader centric system. Uh, people just focus on who's the, the head of a party and they ignore most other people, despite the fact we have significant impacts on their lives. Um, so, you know, uh, I'm going to blame the media. Wow. Blame me. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, thanks, Chris. It's all up to you. It's your fault. Like, I, don't, I, don't want to sound I, I need to sit but, down with a uh, lot more counselors from across Canada to make sure my job's done well. I want to turn to my second segment here, and I want to go and I want to preface this question by this. <laughs> This is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not a policy passed at counsel. This is the counselor's opinion and only his opinion. I get emails <laughs> left, right, and center about this question. I do not know why, but people seem to very take, like, I don't know if they're, like, upset that I've asked this question. But anyway, counselor, in your opinion, as of recording this interview, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Kingston today? Oh, housing and homelessness. How are you addressing affordable it? Affordable housing and homelessness? Uh, well, we have been advocating at all levels of government for increased uh, 
funding for affordable housing. Uh, we just came from AMO and we talked to the Minister of Health for increased funding for any mental health and addiction services. Uh, in my time on council, we've spent about $12 million, both from federal, provincial and municipal money uh, to on mental health and addiction services. Uh, we just passed a motion last week to ask staff what financial tools are in our toolbox to help with mental health and addiction issues. Uh, we put a 0.7% increase on property taxes at the last budget to deal with point <laughs> mental health and addiction issues and affordable housing. Um, we are, I mean, I'm on the, I'm also chair of the housing and homelessness committee for the city of Kingston. Um, so I, I, uh, I feel I, we are, this issue is front and center. Uh, this issue is you drive anywhere in Kingston and you'll see tents. Um, this is a uh, top, the top issue, I think, facing the city of Kingston. Okay. So let's dive into it a little bit here, if you don't mind, because I, I want to learn a little bit more. Um, housing and homeless and particularly mental health are not just municipal issues. It is a uh, bilateral, even trilateral uh, issue that all levels of government need to come together. Now, municipalities, though, are left holding the bag because they're the ones who are on the front line. Scott Pierce, the president of FCM, says you are the government of proximity. It's true. You are the closest to the people. The decisions you make impact the next day. The decision made in Ottawa, maybe a month, maybe six months, maybe a year from now, once it's made. On, uh, in Toronto, maybe three, four weeks, maybe two months, maybe six months longest. But you have an issue now. What's the short term solution to address this issue? Because you can't build houses overnight as much as you try. You cannot address uh, social services without the provincial and federal government coming to you. So what does the city of Kingston do in the short term to sort of help people who are struggling? Uh, I think what we do uh, as a council is anytime we get a dollar from the provincial and federal government, we make sure it gets out the door as quickly as possible. So uh, I'm really pleased with the speed uh, that we've been able to get resources directly to people, whether that's adding additional sh shelter space for those who are unhoused, whether it's adding traditional housing for those who need to get are get, recovering from addiction and mental health services um, and also for building partnerships with people and or, local organization groups uh, that are really on the front lines of the services. So uh, one thing I've done as a counselor and many counselors have done is we work with many local organizations, helping them out, um, talking with them, working with the, them as well uh, on trying to solve this problem. I agree with you. This is uh, the federal government needs to do more in housing. The provincial government needs to do more with health services. But as a council, what we can do is make sure the resources we get get to the people who need it and the partners who are working on the front lines. We have their backs. And is, trust me. Go ahead. I was going to say, is there buy in from the residents of Kingston right now to address this issue? Because. It's great when levels of government come together, but unless you have buy-in from residents who actually say, yes, we need to address this issue, yes, we need to help this issue, uh, you need to sort of not worry about the nimbyism, the people who don't want affordable housing in their backyard, and try to move forward with this issue because it helps the community as a whole. Is there buy-in to address the mental health and houselessness or homelessness population in the in the city of Kingston today, do you believe? Um, I think there will always be people who are skeptical of anything, any change. That is, I think, human nature. You don't say, uh, counselor. Change is what? not bad. What? <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, I, I think there will always be people uh, who are skeptical of any change to the neighborhood, good and good and bad, or just change in general. I think it's an, in, it's an inherent part of being human is we like what we have and we don't want to see anything different. Um, what I would say in the efforts that I've had in my limited time in office, you know, all of 11, 10 months, um, is most people are reasonable. If you sit down and talk to them and uh, I said, so this is the doors to many people. If we don't provide shelters or transitional housing, that person is not going to go to a shelter or a house. They're going to break into your yard. And some of the times that actually does work is just explaining like, like if there's nowhere to go, they'll they are just human beings. They will uh, they they will go to what they need to do. Um, so is there buy in? Uh, I I I don't know if there's buy in. I I have not in my limited time as a counselor faced incredibly strong opposition. 
I think there is a general sense, at least in my district, and I think I have one of the best districts in the city. I think the citizens are great. Um, I think there's a general understanding for most constituents that if we don't provide these resources, worse things are going to happen. Um, and at least that's the conversation I've had with most of my constituents, and they have been very understanding with, uh, of, of that. Um, and we have had, we have, I, down the road from my house, we have a youth shelter. I have worked very well with the coordinator to get that uh, established in the city and make sure that it fits in well with the neighborhood. We have a warming shelter, and we're getting more transitional housing in the neighborhood. And I, I've only had one or two emails, and I've called them and just explained the, my position on it. Um, and most of the time they're pretty reasonable. So, uh, I won't say there's buy-in. There's certainly, I don't think strong opposition because this is a crisis. And people see it. I want to, I want to ask about the issues of Kingston a little bit more here, but I want to uh, change the way that I ask it. You talk about homelessness and mental health being a major issue for Kingston, now, if I went to go ask 100 people on Wilson Street tomorrow, they will all tell me something different. They will yep. all tell me whether it be education, health care, municipal property taxes, so on and so forth. You as counselor probably hear a gambit of issues that are brought forward. But in your limited time, you now understand that municipalities don't have an unlimited windfall of money. You have to run balances every year. Municipalities cannot run debts. How do you, and I, I hate to ask this question the way I ask it, but I think it's the right way to ask it. How do you pick the winners and losers at the end of the day? Because some issues are not going to be addressed every year. Some issues are not going to be able to be addressed because you just don't have the money to address them. So you have to look at the issues and try to appease people to ensure that their issues are being heard, but their issues may not be solved in a short period of time. So how do you do that? And how do you ensure that people's issues are being addressed? Yeah, very good question. Um, I would <laughs> say the way that I would do it is we as council take a look at what we heard at the doors and during the campaign, we get together and we create that our strategic plan of where we want the city to go over the next three or four years. And that strategic plan is built on consensus. Uh, we don't get everything we want uh, to quote the Rolling Stones. You might not get what you want, but you'll, Get, you might get what you need. Um, and it is about prioritizing. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Stones fan. <laughs> hey, uh, I, I was trying my hardest not to quote Spock on that question. So you get you oh, can qu you can quote Rolling Stones all you want. Oh, a fellow nerd. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah. So I think what we do is we rank the issues we hear at the door. Uh, and we kind of all get together and put our wish list of things that, for lack of a better term, I'm going to use a wish list, um, and then go talk to staff and see what the realistic policy outcomes could be in the next four years. Um, so Kingston, we got together and our strategic priorities are housing, our afford housing affordability all across the spectrum due to the housing crisis, uh, um, cl climate stewardship, stewardship because climate change is affecting our city um and that deals with a lot of parks related issues um repairing our roads uh, uh carrying a connected community making sure that there's uh, appropriate roads infrastructure transit um and making sure that we have inclusive economic growth making sure that if we do have economic growth it lifts all boats uh we there are certain things that didn't make it into the strategic plan um but those i thought i thought those were very um based on what i heard at the door and based on what my other counselors heard at the door, those are the priorities of this council. And it's on the city website. Uh, you're going to get that. And that was a direct reflection of what I heard. You're coming up to one year in office, being elected last October in 2022. Um, is Are the issues you're dealing with today what you thought you'd be dealing with when you, for, when you first put your name forward? Um, yes, they're largely what I thought they they would be. Um, I am actually the things that surprised me the most were how well council is getting along, um, and how professional staff is. Uh, I'd say that the real thing I've learned that's frustrating in the last year, um, a real source of frustration is whenever there is an issue that is sort of between jurisdictions or shared jurisdictions, that's really where the frustration hits. 
um, because there seems to be a real disconnect getting all three levels of government to the table to address problems. Uh, the federal government seems to be dancing in one room. The provincial government seems to be dancing in another room. And then the province, this city is just left sort of by itself, um, just kind of doing its own thing um, and trying to navigate between these different levels of government. It kind of feels like we're left behind. An interesting stat that I, I heard is municipalities collect 10% of all taxes and yet we deal with so many problems. 90% of all taxes go to the federal and provincial government. Um, it would be nice if we had more financial resources other than property taxes and grants to deal with so many of those issues. I just wish we had more. Uh, I, I don't want to say I wish we could tax more because that's going to make my email inbox is going to fill up. I wish we had more financial resources and discretion to deal with the problems that are local. I appreciate your honesty on that answer. And I, I'm just cautious of time here. I just looked and I realized we're already 40 minutes into this interview and I haven't got to my favorite segment. And this is the one that I believe in the most. And I believe it's tourism. I think municipalities have a big tourism aspect that is not told in this country. As I traveled across this country, I saw firsthand municipalities doing tourism, right? There's a lot of hidden gems in the communities that people need to see. Don't go spend your dollars out in Cancun, spend them here locally in Canada because it helps the mom and pa shops. For you, uh, Councillor, for you, Brandon, what are some of the hidden gems in Kingston or even in your district that people need to see when they come to Kingston? Uh, people who visit Kingston need to go to this mom and pop coffee shop uh, called Coffee Way Donuts. It is on Division and Concession across from a high school. And have you been there, Chris? I was just there. This is like literally four weeks ago. It their <laughs> apple fritters. Trust me, when they get out of the oven, they're huge and they are a little piece of heaven. Um, and they are just a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, coffee shop. And they, driving by it, it has the most unassuming frontage. You would just look at it like any other place. And it has some of the best pastries in, I'm going to go and say like Eastern Ontario that I've ever had. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, Them fighting words, um, counselor. I just say uh, they're. I think they're the best pastries in Canada, all of Canada. Tim Hortons, eat, eat, you know, take that and uh, up your game. Uh, Coffee Way's coming for you. Uh, it is one of the gems of the district, and certainly one of the gems of, of Kingston. And it sounds weird uh, recommending a coffee shop, but uh, it is the their donuts are phenomenal. Um, and uh, uh, I, uh, another thing if you want to visit kingston visiting shannon park is it's a skate park uh it has you know zip lines for 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 the kids yeah there's usually activities there attending one of those events in shannon park is a real gem uh there as well and kingston i can't sort of mention kingston without its historic downtown uh visiting princess street and market square uh and just south of me in another district and just literally south of me is a memorial center on sunday mornings they have a wonderful farmer's market great food usually live music um every so often they have like a beer tent uh with local craft breweries Kingston has just a vibrant downtown and a vibrant social life. I, I think I have lived in Toronto. I've lived in London. I've lived in Sudbury. I th think Kingston, I think, is just punching above its weight when it comes to local attractions. It's a great city. It's a great city to visit, a great city to stay in, a great city to go to school, and a great city to raise a family in. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, where do you go? After a stressful day, after a long day of council meetings, after a long day of dealing with uh, issues that are affecting your community, where in the community do you go to decompress? And before you answer, I'm going to hold you and I'm going to say this. You cannot say your own house. Too many times councillors and mayors want to say their own house. But I'm going to say no. Where in the community do you like to go to decompress? Councillor, you can say your house if you want, but come on, tell me what where you go. Uh, I love running and I'm going to, um, I really love running along the waterfront. I think I decompress by moving and that is 
you know, I, I, I really do have a love of Kingston's parks. Uh, and I, I love going along the waterfront trails, uh, right in front of the hospital. There's a beautiful park that's been redone. There's breakwater park. It is a great place to just exercise and turn off and, and just go and look at the water. Um, I also really, really love, uh, uh just outside the city is Wolf Island. I love taking the ferry there, uh, with the kids and, you know, going for a bike ride along Wolf Island and going to that restaurant and just look at uh, the, the, the the Island Grill and just looking at the city and just seeing how beautiful it is. Um, and yeah, yeah, like, uh, yeah, those are probably my two ways I unwind. So I want to end with this question because I know you are a busy man, so I want to let you get to with it uh, about your day. Um, where, uh, What makes Kingston such a unique place to live, work and raise a family? Oh, so many things. Um, I think it has, you know, it's got many educational institutions. Uh, so there's that flavor that it adds to it. It's just a perfect combination of what it makes a big city great and a small town great. Um, it's got all the amenities you'd want from a major urban center. It's got a still, I find it with a really friendly small town feel. Um, and it's also got a lively downtown. Um, and I think compared to other areas of Ontario, uh, we really do see what the, what a privilege it is having a downtown that's alive that just attracts tourists and attracts people. Um, I, I just think Kingston's a perfect combination of, you know, if you want to go and you like nature, you can go and explore nature. If you want to go to a great restaurant, you can go to a great restaurant. If you want to see history, it's got history. Um, if you want to just go for a place in a stroll, you can do that. I, I just think it's a phenomenal place. I came here as a student. I stayed here and I'm raising a family here. It's a great city. Counselor, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and taking 45 minutes out of your day and talking about yourself, but also talking about municipal politics. I say this often and I say, I don't think I say it enough though. And I don't think as Canadians, we say it enough. Thank you for serving your community. Thank you for putting your name forward because I don't think municipal politicians actually get the uh, the due that they deserve. So thank you for serving your community and wanting to make your community a better place. Even in the last 45 minutes, I can tell that you're doing it for the right reason. So thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for having me live long and prosper. <laughs> live long and prosper too, Counselor. Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission. As we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like today's episode. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support as well. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes and is on our website. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep driving and delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the cross-border interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, remember, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.